Hi, today I'm going to be presenting to you on health and promotion of prescribed intervention. So a bit of a sort of running order as to what we're talking about. So we're going to go through the current health state of the UK, the role of health professionals, analysing the recommended guidelines for normal adults aged 18 to 64, and evaluating the success of two health campaigns that I've chosen in relation to those of that population group. So a quick forward on the health state of the United Kingdom. Uh, the World Health Organization, it's obviously it's a, it's a well-known fact that there is an obesity epidemic at the minute. The uh, World Health Organization figures were, it's more than doubled since 1980. The actual amount of obese individuals, not overweight, that's obesity itself, and that's defined as anyone with a BMI of more than 30. Uh, more than 1.4 billion adults classified as overweight, with a further 500 million as obese. 65% of the world's population live in countries where obesity carries more of a risk than malnutrition in the terms of being underweight. And more than 14 million children under the age of five are classified as overweight as well. So the role of a health professional first. So the World Health Organization again define a health profession or as anyone who is directly involved with the um, intervention, promotion or prescription with the nation's health. That goes as far as sort of medicine, referring to health campaigns. So obviously GPs are involved with every position of that. A couple of other examples are nurse practitioners, dietitians and physiotherapists, which we'll go into physios a little bit more later. So an exercise professional defines anyone that's involved with the prescription and deliverance of an exercise programme. Personal trainers are a typical example of that, working in sort of gym environments with people in that respect. Other examples can include physiotherapists who come under health and exercise because they also do uh, devise exercise programs for uh, clients. PE teachers as well in schools um, have a role in promoting health and have sort of devise exercise programs for children and what the uh, benefits of sport should be put forward. And so examining the role of a GP, GPs are often the sort of first point of contact for a patient and that can go down the exercise referral route with that part. Um, the NHS careers website advertised being a GP is the opportunity to prevent disease, not just treat. So that highlights the importance of them promoting campaigns that are useful for the general population, be it healthy eating, sort of exercise referral schemes or just general physical activity. Uh, it does raise the question with such short appointment slots, 10 minutes in most cases for a GP, do they actually have the opportunity to promote healthcare? Um, with sort of chronic diseases now, diabetes, um, or prevalence of osteoporosis, osteoporosis from obesity, they rarely get one of the opportunities to actually promote general well-being advice. It tends to be a treat and the patient gets sort of pushed out the door with that part. Uh, GPs do cite one of the major barriers to physical activity promotion is the time frame they've actually got. Um, so on to exercise professional at this point. So we have the levels of gym instructor. So level two, level three, level four. Um, that's images from reps itself. So a level two instructor is the base level of instructor, typically working within a gym's environment, exercise to music and physical activity for children. Level three, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail, is more advanced, going on to exercise referral and some advanced parts to it. Level four is a step up again, which works primarily, primarily within a clinical environment, uh, managing conditions such as respiratory disease, cancer rehab, and accelerated rehab for uh, military side of things. So, examining the role of the level three gym instructor, uh, low incidence of reported problems, which we mentioned from Walton et al, um, highlights the professionalism of the individual themselves, uh, and that the low incidence of issues in exercise for referral with a level three gym instructor should be interpreted as justification to work with someone who isn't fully qualified. It highlights the importance that with any exercise prescription that they have the relevant, relevant qualification. So it's a level, M, level 3 MDQ with personal training. You can obviously specialise that into exercise referral, advanced exercise to music. Um, you can 
get these qualifications through a range of sort of companies, skills active are the sort of governing body for it, and uh, most instructors themselves will be registered with reps, registered exercise professionals. Some of the qualifications, they can be done in as little as six weeks, which bears the question, are these people getting the experience in that short space of time to advance or adapt to any situation with the client, particularly sort of behavioural therapy, if they got the chance to see those models that they sort of trans theoretical model in action, or is it they're going to learn on the go and not have the sort of relevant knowledge in some, in some instances to help people. Physiotherapists, classes of both health and fitness professionals, they're involved with the management of conditions and the improvement of health in addition to the fitness programs that they prescribe. Uh, physiotherapists typically have a Bachelor of Science or Master of Science degree in physiotherapy. It takes anywhere from three to six years to get qualified. In that sort of time scale, they have much more time to get the knowledge for any situation. With this debate between private and um, public physiotherapists, which you get on the NHS, people who are, probably, who are paying for a private physio to treat the condition are more likely to listen to what they will say because they are paying for their advice, as opposed to a public physiotherapist, which again, with time constraints and cuts to the NHS, they may not get that interaction with the patient on that one. So the exercise guidelines for adults, at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity per week and muscle strengthening activities on two or more days that work all the major muscle groups. That isn't a set amount to do in one, uh, one sitting. You, NHS suggests you break it up into smaller, ma more manageable chunks. That helps it with the exercise adherence because the task doesn't seem as mountainous. Oh, I've got to achieve 150 minutes rather than 30 minutes a day, five days a week on that part. So the, the guidelines can be bent and changed and you can substitute in vigorous activity which drops it to 75 minutes per week and vigorous intensity activity but the muscle strength and still remains the same. Guidelines for young people as a comparison. So the guidelines for young people are 60, 60 minutes of physical activity every day. So this is at people aged 5 to 18 and muscle strength you know, three days of the week. This part of the, it's to promote growth and bone density in young people with the sort of development that they're going through the guidelines are more strenuous on them as opposed to maintaining sort of physical, physical fitness within 18 to 64 year olds. So the effectiveness of the guidelines, one of the major ones that came into play with chronic disease was diabetes. People with diabetes who were adhered to the standard guidelines had improved glucose control, that and the sort of adiposity being reduced as well as just classic risk factors for CHD um, on that. Um, um. So health intervention, change for life is one of the big ones launched in 2009. The idea of three objectives for them on a multidisciplinary front. Build physical activity in today living, encourage families to adopt healthy behaviours. So the latest one is smart swaps, so you input a food onto a little wheel, twist it around and it gives you a healthy substitute instead of the one you're having and promoting incentives for better health. They cited it as a resounding success, uh, achieving all their targets in 2010, one year on, and then they set themselves advanced targets. But the targets they hit was, it was around 30,000 sort of women who responded to all with children under the age of well, 5 to 11 was the children's age. And that goes in response to a survey. They cited that as a success, but 30,000 women out of the population in the UK is a very small amount. So obviously they're aiming to build on those targets as we go forward and build more physical activity into your daily lives of children. A free swim program, so we're focusing on getting adults and children more physically active. Worked out around one point again, 2009. So age 16 and under, in addition to the people over the age of 60, so just at the upper end of the normal uh, age bracket that we're working with. 1.75 million free swims were undertaken on that uh, with those, and that was a resounding success to them. It later went on to the second year of the campaign, and that was in line with free swimming lessons as well, and not just a free swimming pool. 
again, the uptake was hugely successful in sort of children who were um, under the age of 16, and again, people over the age of 16. Then saying it's a resounding success, compared to other interventions where sort of inter some interventions are paid for, a free swim programme should, in theory, always have a high uptake because it's, it's free for people to attend. It was done in local leisure centres and the primary focus on the first year of lessons ended up key to the second year with the relationships built between industry and the healthcare side of things. And so that enabled them to go on to free swimming lessons in children. And that promoted physical activity in those guys. It's not running anymore. Um, funding was the major thing. They were given an allocation of the budget for certain age groups. And once that had gone, they received no more funding. The, um, the Department for Media and Culture, which is part of the government side, they wrote the report and said it was a resounding success, but they criticised the fact that the funding had been cut. And in relation to the obesity side of things, in interventions like this, they said were key in what they were doing. And to have the funding cut and nothing similar around to this, so Swim for Life was the other one, they changed for life, which under 16s only. It didn't focus on the over 60 side of things, and they're very little. To those guys in relation to that. Just a summary of what we've covered. So exercise professionals should promote the exercise with any client content that, contact that they have, be it sort of a 10-minute consultation or if it's a physio working on a patient for a half an hour, they'll get that chance to talk about that part. Ensure the clients are exercising in a safe manner and using the programs that they've prescribed to them, and that be about the gym environment or a physio checking upon someone after uh, post-consultation. Exercise guidelines themselves should be re-evaluated consistently to remain, make sure they're up to date with the latest scientific info and focus on making the goals seem more achievable and not as meritorious to some people. Thank you very much, Liam.